Support of the newspaper bill, um, particularly to my colleagues Andrea Fitman and Dion Spitzer, who have been fearless in putting this film festival together and I'm so grateful. Right now, this entire event is being live streamed on the bill's website, so please tweet it out and let everybody know. And for those of you watching at home, we're really happy to have you here. And um, I'm happy to tell you a little bit more about the festival sometime this afternoon. But to keep us on schedule, I'm going to turn it over to Dion Spitzer, who is an incredible journalist for Bill, and he'll be introducing the next panel. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Paula. And um, yeah, first of all, I want to say, again, on, on behalf of Newspaper Build, we are very happy, we're very honored to have you and, and co-host this, um, this important event and to raise awareness to the, to the issues um, in, these, uh, in these movies. Um, for the first um, for the first panel, we're gonna discuss, um, and you can ask questions and then have remarks about the film. Um, I would like to introduce um, Rahil and Zoil Raza, um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce you. Um, Rahil and Zoil are um, both leading activists from um, from uh, the organization Muslims Facing Tomorrow, and um, they are both. Um, both featured in um, Paula Queskin's movie uh, *Honor Diaries*, which we are going to see um, later today. And yeah, it's a it's a pleasure to to have you here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome. Thank you. So um, the movie we just saw um, was about um, forced marriage, about child marriage. Um, first of all, what's what's your assessment? How how prevalent? Is this is this issue in in the regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan? Well, um, this really touched home, close to my heart. I was born and brought up for the first two decades of my life in Pakistan, 
Uh, what I am absolutely delighted to see and to be here is that five years ago, they could never talk about this issue. Five years ago, you could, they could never have made a film like this, the issue of child marriage. It is prevalent according to UNICEF figures um, underage ma marriage, almost 3% of uh, Pakistani girls are married under the age of 15. Although the official age of marriage is 16, they want to raise it to 18. Uh, there has been a push by some religious leaders to lower it to nine. So you can see the challenge. Uh, it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, it's prevalent. It happens because of socioeconomic reasons. It happens because of the tribal and customary practices of exchanging girls like property to settle tribal disputes. Uh, it happens because um, of, of extreme poverty in areas where girls are bought and sold as uh, chattel. And as awareness is coming, as films like this are becoming uh, you know, more and more popular, we hope that there will be a change. So would you, would you say that this that these issue of, um, of um, resolving tribal issues, it's, it's more prevalent in the, in the tribal areas in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Yes. Because yes. we saw then the, um, the, the people, they fled to the relative safety of, the, of a bigger city yes. where they have some... It is very prevalent in the tribal areas because there are certain parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan where the regular law of the country doesn't apply. Yeah. It is tribal law. You know, this is one of the reasons where we are facing many of the issues, especially with regards to women's rights. You can implement uh, women's rights in, in, in an uh, urban society where there is education, where there is understanding. But in the tribal areas, the tribal leaders are the ones who are the judge and the jury, and they make the laws and they implement their own laws. So it's very difficult to break through that. And it, this uh, practice is prevalent there. Having said this, uh, it's not unheard of this uh, idea of uh, forced and underage marriage also happening very much in the educated society, also happening in um, uh, rural areas uh, and urban areas together, but far less. Because once a woman is socially, economically empowered, when she is educated, she understands what her rights are and she can fight back to a great extent. Um. We saw that in, in the movie that um, that it's actually a man who was was helping them to to get out of, of this um, of this of this deadly struggle. What what would you say? How how important is the role of of, of men in um, in leading this struck, uh, this 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 um, struggle in in, uh, in empowering women? I think. Uh, good morning, first of all. I think this uh, was beautifully shown in the movie because it's men who make these so-called laws, or tribal laws, or cultural laws. And it's men who have to break it down. So they play a very important role. Uh, besides uh, underage marriage and uh, forced marriage, this movie also showed mental abuse towards women, which turns into physical abuse if they challenge the status quo. So uh, it's a very important message that has been, bought, uh, has been bought through this movie. And the beauty of it is that the ugliness of the certain aspects of the culture has been shown through the beauty of the landscape of Pakistan. Um, is this movie, um, is it movie um, being shown in Pakistan somewhere? Uh, yes, this movie has won many awards, and uh, surprisingly, uh, the producer thought that there would be major pushback, but there wasn't. It's uh, shown in Pakistan. I had heard about this when it first came out. Everyone in my family who knows that I'm fighting for women's rights and you know I'm involved, they told me about it. I've seen it a few times, but you know it always touches me to the core because. What is beautiful about this film is that it touches on many of the issues that permeate society. You see the honor culture. Uh, you know, although it is the woman and her child who have, their, who have to save their lives, but if they're found, they'll be killed. So, you know, for them, it's a vicious circle. It is the permeation of the honor culture throughout society. It is the misogyny, the patriarchy, uh, the helpless, helplessness of uh, women who are not uh, economically empowered. And I think that's a very, very important aspect that we have to remember. The economic empowerment plays a great role in this social patriarchal norms, culture, tradition. All of this can be broken, but once a woman is uh, 
economically empowered, she can stand up for her own rights. So, you know, I want to thank all of you and Paula uh, for bringing this uh, honor issue up to the front. Yes, I think it was uh, Paula's honor diary that that is a milestone in and all the other movies we see about honor as uh, some won the uh, uh, prize. prize in the film festival Oscar, Oscar. Yeah. and that was also following Honor Diaries so Honor Diaries is the pioneer in this but uh, to your initial question of course I always like to disagree with Rahil <laughs> that <laughs> If there was a pushback, yes, there was a pushback when the movie first came out. And the clerics are still ranting and raving about uh, why it should not be shown. But the general public, thanks to people like Paula, who have created enough awareness that the people want to see and they want to experience uh, what is happening. So um, now the chance for the audience, if you have any questions, any remarks to and so I, yes, please. Hi, um, at the beginning you said that uh, a film like this couldn't have been made five years ago and you know, couldn't work in the system like this in 2015. You mentioned the importance of honor diaries. Do you think that's what sparked your film or are there other reasons why this has come along over the years? I believe it's a combination. Certainly honor diaries coming on, you know, out into the open and becoming an internationally acclaimed film has given directors and producers this uh, idea that this is something that can be talked about. But in a country like Pakistan, it was also the Academy Award-winning movie, Girl in the River, uh, from last year that allowed uh, laws to be put into place against honor killings. And following this film, there was an 18-part television series about incest, unheard of to be shown on the main screen in Pakistan. So there is hope when women take the reins in their own hands and when they start exposing the issues. You know, our mandate is to expose, educate, and eradicate. And I think this is the first part of it, is to expose the problem. That's an excellent point, Laila, and perhaps it's something that could be picked up on, but again, you have to remember the culture in which the film is made and the culture in which the change has to come. You see, they have to, to understand, well, for, for them, they're marrying their child off. And yes, I, I do agree that it somehow tends to legalize it. But, uh, you know, this is a project that we can certainly talk about. It's a language is extremely important in the future. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. What we have to be careful about is, yes, we see tribal areas in Pakistan. Yes, we see Africa in movies where certain uh, cultural norms are practiced, like FGM, etc. But what we have to be so careful and sensitive, and here's where your point comes in, that we should not allow this to be imported into the Western countries or the democratic countries, because then it becomes a virus, a plague, and it just, and people try and, you're very right in saying people try and justify it in terms like marriage. So maybe we can start from here and then let it go towards. And, and I actually want to add on to this by saying that it's really interesting and ironical for me to see a film from Pakistan which is speaking about the issue and yet in the West, political correctness stops people from discussing these issues. I mean, Paula talked about it. There was pushback against honor diaries which did not even directly address the actual issue, you know, it spoke about honor-based violence, but political correctness holds people back in the West. And yet, you know, this is happening now in the East where the actual problems are taking place. So let's never forget 
that this is not something happening out there. It's happening right here. It's happening in the West. And unless each and every one of us stands up and says no, change won't come. Any more questions? We change the mindset when we talk about the time and place. I mean, you know, we can't live in the 7th century, 8th century, 9th century. You know, for us it's really important to say this is the 21st century and we do not accept this anymore. And I think that these are the cultural norms that we establish ourselves. There are no laws or legalities as far as much of this is concerned. You know, the law is in one place, but what happens at a tribal level? And by tribal mentality, it exists among communities in the West as well. So we have to change the tribal mindset and say, you know, you're not living in the ninth century anymore. And I agree with you. My grandmother was married at 15. But it's not something that we accept now in the 21st century. We have to move ahead. Things are different. And we have to bring about those changes according to the time that we live. You know, it's OK to say, all right, that was OK for that time, perhaps. But it's no longer OK. And I think what Leila said, adding this uh, you know, uh, idea that it is child abuse, it's pedophilia, it's human rights abuse, adding on all those labels would hopefully get us a sense that we do not accept this anymore. I think that there is a very distinct difference between an arranged marriage and child marriage. Child marriage is forced marriage. Child marriage, as I just said, is you know, is child abuse. It's human rights abuse. Uh, so um, you know, arranged marriage exists in many Eastern cultures, which is arranged marriage with consent. Uh, there have been papers written about it in which we wanted to add this idea that arranged marriage, but with consent. Anytime it is, uh, first of all, they have to be adults. Uh, you know, consensual arranged marriage between adults where the families are involved is something that happens in entire Eastern society, and uh, that's not the same as forced marriage. A child doesn't have a say in a situation where they are being forced into a marriage. So there is that distinction there, I believe. And, uh, you know, as long as uh, we know that it's adults and consensual, that is how I differentiate between arranged and child marriage. I think we, we have to, to go ahead with our schedule now. Or um, do we have a break now, or do we continue with the next movie? We're starting in the next one in three minutes. OK, so, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so and then I, I think okay. we should, uh, yeah, can announce that the next one is, uh, is um, it's called Butterflies. It's being sent to us from Iran. Yeah. And it shows the struggle of a woman feeding her baby in, in, a, in a society where, where exposure is forbidden. And that's Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me. For being here.
لطفاً بیان منالکت یا بیس ملا فرب گیره مرتا پاشویه که ویلا تشن نجاکت मेरी अपनी ओन स्टोरी है बताऊं जब सात साल के हुए होंगे तो एक दिन स्कूल से आए थे तो मम्मा ने कहा कि ये पड़ोस की एक ओल्ड लड़की थी कि इनके साथ जाओ इनकी बेटी की बर्थडे है तो बुलाया बच्चे को लेके गई अंदर लेके गई कमरे के अंदर वो कमरा था वहाँ जाके कहा कि अच्छा बैठो और सो जाओ क्यों सोएंगे बच्चे कहाँ हैं हाँ सो उन्होंने युग पकड़ा फिर हम जब गारमेंट्स से निकाल दी है और क्या किया हम रो रहे थे बुरी तरह से कहा घर जाओ और मम्मी को कहा कि क्या किया और कहाँ भेजा था कुछ नहीं मैं अभी घी लगा देती हूँ उन्होंने गर्म घी किया और वो लगाए हल्दी और घी बस ये हुआ था उस वक्त It happened 
without any understanding in the sense that I was not coached for it. I was not told this is going to happen. I was not made to understand what is going to happen. I was not made to understand the implications of what is going to happen. It is just that I was taken, you know, that okay, I'm going to buy you something. Come on, let's go. And I was taken into this dark room and it was a horrific experience looking back now that uh, something as gory and gross took place and uh, that's me when I was about six or seven and that's me when I was younger than that and it's scary to think that people can actually take their own children that young and cut off parts of their body willfully and be happy about it. So. नकिया को मैं लेके गई थी तो नकिया का एक्सपीरियंस क्या है कि पहले नकिया है ना तो ऐसे ही नकिया है ना तो कुछ भी बात होती है तो घबरा ज्यादा जाती है उसको थोड़ा बहुत इन तरह थोड़ा काम की खबर आती है ना कहता है खबर नोती नोती खबर पड़ेगी ऐसी क्या खतना हाँ मैं बोलती हूँ कि अभी की जो लड़कियाँ होता है ना उसको सब थोड़ा मालूम चिकन नो एवरीथिंग तो क्या वो डर गई थी कि ये ब्लेड से कुछ काटेंगे कि करेंगे तो वो डर गई थी ना तो उसका प्रॉब्लम हो गया था लाओ तो तारा आग नहीं बताओ तो उसने है ना हाथ बीच हाथ बीच में रख दिया था नक्किया ने तो इसकी लाओ ने बता ना ये ना फोटो ले तार अन्याय मुके ना फोटो आगर तेरी आंगली जरा आना नज़ी पाम शी हैव कट लिटिल बिट भूल से है ना तो उसकी आंगली कट हो गई थी तो वो भी कंफ्यूज हो गए थे तो उसकी आंगली कट गई थी ना तो शी गॉट अ लॉट ब्लड उसकी बराबर नहीं हुई थी फिर आय सेकेंड टाइम मुझे करानी पड़ी उसकी अच्छा कि वो जरा वो क्या है खटना की लिटिल बिट भी वो स्किन है ना उसके लिटिल बिट भी नहीं रहने जाए कंप्लीटली यानी कंप्लीट निकालनी ही पड़े वो बहुत हराम की बोटी बोलते हैं उसको वो लिटिल बिट भी नहीं रहनी चाहिए It's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sunnah to perform khatna on the girl child. When she starts her seventh year and it has been, it has been practiced in many areas of the world also today. What is it done for? The answer, it is our faith, it is our faith, first answer. Second answer, scientifically, it moderates the urge and it has many benefits. The world in which today we are living, we all know what are the problems today, but when a woman's urge is moderated, many sins are eliminated from the society. It gives purity to the society. It gives a bond between the husband and wife because the wife is satisfied with her husband. She doesn't need to look for another man or hunt for another man. In that uh, we call a, it's call of Haram Ki Boti, Haram Ni Chamri that we call in Gujarati, is name of Haram Ni Chamri and in, it's used to take out, in that, that Haram Ni Chamri it gives sex very much, 
for that reason we take out but uh, my mother would read out i mean the word articles in the paper about i think she was i just had carried out a piece on a body woman who had come out against circumcision a female circumcision so that was my thing my first time when even i realized that there's another side to this or it might be but it's not an acceptable ritual and then it's more in the recent past that actually i mean i i used to argue with my mom about it and it's more in the recent past that i've taken a firm stand against it and as i said it's unacceptable at various levels one you're inhibiting another person's sexuality for very very heinous reasons for you know the preservation of a certain kind of marriage or the fact that people should have certain kinds of virtues and for the sake of all that you just take the liberty of cutting off somebody's body part and you know cutting off a little girl's clitoris क्या चीज थी मैंने नहीं समझ पाई और कभी ध्यान भी नहीं दिया था अब जब थोड़ी सी अक्ल आई तो अब सोचने लगी है कि करते क्या है तो वो कोई बर्ताने वाला नहीं है जो लेडी करते थे वो तो नहीं रहे जिन्होंने हमारी की थी तो अब क्या चीज रिमूव करते हैं मुझे तो अभी भी सही मालूम नहीं आई नोट क्लियर अबाउट इट और कभी खुल के डिस्कशन कभी हुआ भी नहीं है कि जैसे हमारे यहाँ वाज होती है इतनी लंबी चोरी सब चीज़ें उसमें बताते हैं तो कभी इसके ऊपर रोशनी डाले कि कोई बताए कि भाई है क्या चीज़ क्या लॉजिक है क्या इसके पीछे साइंस है क्या इसके अंदर जो है फिजियोलॉजी वीमेन फिजियोलॉजी के ऊपर इसका असर पड़ता है तो किसी ने डिटेल में कभी बताने की कोशिश नहीं की चल रहा है जो चल रहा है पन है कि कुछ करते हैं ज़्यादा ऐसा सीवियर नहीं होता दो मिनट का कुछ करते हैं अब वो कौन सी चमड़ी आ जाती है उसको रिमूव करते हैं बस जो अपन अभी पढ़ रहे को स्टिचिंग कर लेते हैं और बंद कर देते हैं ऐसी ऐसी क्रियोलिटी तो यहाँ नहीं अ बॉय हु नेक्स्ट वेडिंग इन द फैमिली द लिटल बॉय वुड बी सिटिंग विद रूम ऑन द हॉर्स एंड यू नो द वेडिंग कार्ड्स this our sons or our grandsons or oh, khatna but uh, with girls none of that happens and at some level the community does have a feeling that it's not a i mean that they're not doing something that may be right and also it's something that only our community does in india you know my perception and her perception regarding this that it's all in the name of tradition which people must follow do you agree to this uh, not exactly because uh, i whatever i have under lens whatever his holiness says there is one reason be a very strong reason behind it we may come to know it in future i don't know but whatever he says is always correct and we have 100% faith in him so i do believe that he tells it so we should follow it it's not in the just in the name of tradition it's a, in the name of faith we have in his holiness and um uh when you were small at the age of say 12 or 14 did you try to reason it out mm, no it, it, that is too small to uh, uh, no no not exactly No. Did you ever question? No. <laughs> Did you ask your mom? Yeah, but I think a seven-year-old child is too small to ask such questions. And actually, not only would men not know, not only would brothers not know. I think women themselves do not have much information on this subject. as to what is this practice why is this practice being uh, uh, perpetuated 
what is the implication of this practice i i think if you will ask people in the community if you will ask women in the community 9 out of 10 will not know it's something which their mothers have told them to do so they are doing it and it's something which they will tell get their daughters done without understanding it without questioning it or without even knowing more about it so it's it's as horrific as that and as far as the men are concerned they are clueless they are absolutely clueless that something like this happens in a community and I am willing to bet you ask 10 men 10 on 10 will say what <laughs> does it happen it's, it's going to be that मेरे साथ सब कुछ होता गया क्योंकि मेरी माँ मानते थे इसलिए पर जब मैं एक लेडी हो गई वो पोजीशन में आ गई जब 20 21 साल की और मेरे अपने बच्चे हुए तो मेरी दो बेटी हुई तो तब से मैंने थाम लिया था कि जो चीज मुझे जिनका आंसर नहीं मिलता जो चीज का वो मैं मेरे बच्चों के साथ नहीं होने दूँगी तो मैं सारी कस्टम्स सुन्नत वाली भी और सारी चीज मैंने कभी मेरी बेटी के साथ नहीं होने दिया जिसका आंसर मुझे नहीं मिला कि ये हम क्यों करते हैं But I do believe that there is some good reason and as told by the seniors that it moderates the urge it moderates the urge and that is the main reason behind it so that you don't there are less chances for extra marital affairs and all असल में इसके पीछे जो खास मोटिव वो ये है कि लड़कियां जो है किसी के साथ भाग नहीं जाए या बिफोर मैरिज कहीं सेक्स ना करा तो उसमें सेक्स फीलिंग ना आए कि वो हस्बैंड के अलावा और किसी सेक्स करा है उसको रोकना और अगर कभी ऐसा किसी के साथ केस होता था कि कोई लड़की किसी से लव में है मतलब तो उसके बस यही कहते थे कि इसकी खतना नहीं हुई क्या इसकी खतना नहीं हुई थी क्या या खतना बराबर नहीं हुई होगी इसीलिए उसने ऐसा कदम उठाया ये ये जरबे पेरेंट्स को दिखाते और इसीलिए वो बच्चे को अपने कंट्रोल में रखने के लिए डिसिप्लिन में रखने के लिए कुछ भी रहा होता होगा कंजर्वेटिव सोसाइटी में तो उसको फॉलो करते My experience, like I, I had been written on knowing that uh, when it was being removed, my underwear and everything, I was totally fear. Um, I had a fear about that. So I just, when the auntie caught with the plate, I started screaming and I kept my hand inside, so it, in the between. So it got a cut and then we had to rush to a doctor. And so I, either that time, I don't know much what did go on. So I don't know much about my husband. I'm MBBS. I am a family practitioner. Uh, children and yeah, children and uh, uh, ladies, gents, all. Uh, Mom, I wanted to ask you: Do you perform khatna on young girls? Yes, I'm. I'm doing it. पहले तो क्या के सिर्फ ब्लेड होती है ना उनको जरा गरम करके कर लेते थे इतनी तो थोड़ी तब that time little bit idea was there that without the hot we cannot touch our skin. कि कुछ इफेक्शन हो जावे ये हो जावे इतना तो करते हैं मगर अभी थोड़ा क्या एडवांस होता है सब लोग तो क्या उसको फिर दवा बवा लगा के थोड़े कर ऐसे दर्द तो कुछ होता है नहीं थोड़ा एक लिटिल बिट ब्लड निकलता है बस तो माम वो ब्लेड लिया था हाँ ब्लेड लिया था तो माम आपकी डॉटर्स के टाइम जब हुआ था तो आप � 
और ये भी जो घटना भी अगर कोई भी इंसान कर वॉट एवर वुमन शी इज डूइंग फर्स्ट शी हैव टू टेक रजा ऑफ मोला अगर रजा हो आपके पास तो ही हम कर सकते मेन थिंग वो मेन पॉइंट है मतलब नहीं ऐसा तो कुछ नहीं आई डोंट नो अबाउट इट बट जैसे ऐसा है कि रिलीजन में ऐसा है कि ऐसा करने का ऐसा तो वी आर डूइंग इन लाइफ ऑन इट सी मैनी थिंग्स आर आर देर इन द रिलीजन अपने जैसा बोलता है वैसा वी आर डूइंग इट लाइक दैट वी आर डूइंग द सेम वे फर्स्ट वो टू गिव इट रिलीजियस सेंशन इज बुलशिट बिकॉज रिलीजन एक्सेप्ट ह्यूमन बींग्स एज अ क्रिएशन ऑफ गॉड सो आई एम क्रिएट द वे आई एम आई एम क्रिएशन ऑफ गॉड according to your own religion then what gives man any right to tamper with that what gives human beings any right to mess with that so it is against i think any any basis of religion i mean abortion many religions consider it a wrong act why because you are doing something you are taking away something which they say is an act of god right in this case also i am created the way i am created what gives you the right to take away something from me and from my body nobody gives nobody has been given any right to do that you know if she is 18 19 or 20 or 25 or 40 whatever age intercas agar uski khatna pehle karate fir nikah karte itna itna important you can understand what i tell अगर कोई भी दाऊदी बोरा लड़का है एंड शी वांट्स टू मैरी इंटर कास्ट मुस्लिम सिख इज वॉट एवर गर्ल एंड दैट गर्ल टेल दैट आई एम बीइंग अ दाऊदी बोरा तो फॉर दिस घटना वर्क हैव बीन डन एंड आफ्टर दैट वर्क हैव बीन डन तो ही निकाह पड़ सकते अगर वो घटना नहीं होती तो निकाह भी नहीं पड़ते मीन्स घटना मीन कम्प्लीट दाऊदी बोरा वूमन वूमेन राइट्स इशू की तरह से इसको देख सकते हैं कि जो भी कुछ है क्या डिप्राइव करना चाहते हैं और इट इज डिप्राइवेशन ऑफ सेक्सुअल लस्ट वो कहते हैं पर क्या सेक्सुअल लस्ट होता है नहीं होता है वो कुछ मैं समझ नहीं पाई उसको सो इज इट द आइडिया You know, I think you should ask this question to to religious heads who perpetuate this uh, practice as to why is it that they want this to continue and why is it that they want this to happen. You know, uh, obviously it stems from an understanding that uh, women uh, should not be allowed uh, sexual pleasure. सेक्स फील नहीं सेक्स तो फील कर सकती है मगर जो एक्सेक्स जो होता है ना जो कभी भी किसी लड़के को देख कर एकदम एट्रैक्शन हमारे कम्युनिटी में इतना नहीं है जो एट्रैक्शन कभी क्या है पिक्चर देख के आ जाता है फोटोग्राफ देख के आ जाता है कभी कभी बात करके आ जाता है वो क्या ये चीज नहीं होती है ना तो यू कैन सी अभी हो गया है मगर कभी भी आपने इतना सुना कि बोरा कम्युनिटी में इतना हुआ ये हुआ कुछ हुआ बोरा कम्युनिटीज में इतना नहीं होता है इतना सेक्स होता है पर क्या कंट्रोल में होता है तो आपने क्या बहू से पूछा है कि उसने खतला कराई हुई है कि नहीं पूछने का सवाल ही नहीं है मैं वो हमारी कम्युनिटी से है तो शी इज इस एंड शी इज ऑल्सो डॉक्टर और वो तो उस उसके तो एक्चुअली उस उसके तो मैंने ही करी थी वेन शी वॉज यंग आई डन आर करना शी रिमेम्बर्स मुझे तो आया शी दे रिमेम्बर आंटी आप ही थे याद तो सर कभी जब बच्चे आते हैं ना तो पहले थोड़ा रोते हैं क्यों करने के टाइम पर नेचुरल कोई भी रहेगा फिर जो फिर वो वो लोग जब भी मुझे मिलते हैं कभी भी हेलो आंटी करके जाते डॉक्टर आंटी हेलो हाय मैं मैं मेरे को हाय कैसे बेटा हेलो करके भाग जाते हैं स्माइल एंड स्टिल नाउ आई कैन से दैट आई नेवर वांट टू सी दैट लेडी एंड दैट लेडी इज माय नानी मास फ्रेंड
I have an educated female relative, for instance, who is a totally for circumcision because she believes that her prophet has told, you know, uh, has told the community that uh, so, uh, female circumcision is necessary because um, women have far more sexual urges than men, and uh, which is why women's uh, sexuality needs to be curbed because men have to go out and do the hard work, and they won't, you know, they can't be having sex with their wives all day. Therefore, it is necessary to curb women's sexuality, and if they are not circumcised, they will all turn into prostitutes. So, and she's an educated woman, and she believes this wholeheartedly, and she determinedly says that she's gotten her daughter circumcised, and she will do it to her granddaughters as well. Which is a little scary because I don't understand where people get these beliefs from, and how they can actually buy this shit. I can say it could be true that it reduces sexual desire because I have seen in movies in the, that time that girls go on with attraction that so it might be girls go on with attraction because of that sex. So I can say I have been to Kalpana so I can say it reduces sexuality. But I think the, the, the whole, the game plan here is that the woman herself is convinced. It's a battle of ideas and it's the ideas, as far as that is concerned, they won it, you know. So they have indoctrinated the woman. And that's where the challenge lies in, you know, undoing that indoctrination, in undoing that belief system, in undoing that understanding which women have and uh, you know challenging that so i think once you win that battle it the system will reverse itself but it, it's a huge battle and it's it's a it, it's a battle which will take some some struggle and some effort मालूम मैंने कभी बिगैर खतना के कोई सेक्स किया जो बताओ कि दोनों में क्या डिफरेंस रहा क्योंकि एट द एज ऑफ सेवन ये हो जाता है उसके पहले आपको कुछ भी पता नहीं है अब उसके बाद का एक्सपीरियंस क्या है तो क्या पता अब इंटरकोर्स में पेन होता है तो सबको ही होता होगा हम तो यही जानते हैं अब पता नहीं अब कैसे डिफरेंस कर कैसे कर ये तो बता नहीं सकते ना आप सेल्फ अकेले नहीं बता सकते हो कि भाई अगर खतना ना हुई होती तो क्या होता क्योंकि उसके पहले का तो कोई एक्सपीरियंस आपके पास है नहीं Program coordinator for um, for NGO um, Stop Af 
F stop FGM in the Middle East. Lila Hussein is um, is featured also in the movie Honor Diaries. And um, uh, no, I wasn't, but um, <laughs> I I'm very good friends with the Honor Diaries women. Yes. Ah, okay, but uh, you're not in the movie. I'm not in the ah, movie, but, but I was a great supporter of the movie. Ah, That's okay, how I met all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got this wrong. But you're in a, in another documentary about the FGM in the UK, yes, right? Yes, in the uh, the Crow Cup, okay. which was shown at last year's Sen Sensor Films Festival. Okay. Yes. So. We now saw a movie about FGM in um, in India, which is um, when when I think about FGM, um, places come up like Africa or Iraq or Iran, but I haven't heard about FGM in, in India. Is it an is it um is it a widespread issue? Is it a widespread problem in India? Um, FGM itself is a global issue, and I and I'm f I'm glad actually again you know. Um, Paul and, and the team who use this platform to finally share this. So, I mean, as a campaigner, I've been involved in this for the last 15 years. I've known about South Asian women undergoing this practice, but somehow the media didn't want to tell these stories. The communities were not ready to come out and tell these stories. But it's not just South Asian women. 80 million girls in Indonesia and Malaysia have undergone this practice. Uh, we now hear cases in Colombia, so it's widespread. It's no longer an African or Middle Eastern or Asian issue. Um, I was recently in uh, Washington, D.C. for the first anti-FGM summit, and the day the summit started, uh, a news broke out of an American white woman who has undergone the practice. So the language might be different, but in Europe and the US, we, they practice something called clidiotomy for many years, where removing, uh, apparently if a woman had an orgasm, that meant she had mental health issues. So the idea of controlling women's bodies and sexuality has always existed. Um, so yeah, so the idea of FGM or controlling women's bodies, it's a global issue and it's widespread, but I'm glad finally we've changed the face of what an FGM woman looks like. There's always been an African girl with a headscarf, and that's not the case. Um, <laughs> Hannah, um, Leila just mentioned that it's a global issue. Um, um, your experience in, in combating FGM, would you say um, that it, that there has been that there has to be a specific approach for the for the um, for the specific area where FGM is, is practiced, as there are many different forms of FGM? Is it, um, that you have to to approach the people there um, according to to the to the kind of practice they are, or the the um, the, um, the, the like what they are doing to to reason about this, and then how do you argue with them? And and when tell us about your 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 um, daily daily fight against FGM. Well, first of all, let me correct you on uh, NGO. We're not an NGO. Oh, uh, I work for an NGO, but ah. the NGO is called Wadi, which works on all kinds of issues in northern Iraq, and it does focus on women's issues. And out of this NGO, we formed um, a campaign sto uh, called Stop FGM Middle East, and by now, Stop FGM Middle East and Asia. And the reason is, and this was your first question to Leda, um, 10 years ago, in 2006, we found in northern Iraq that FGM was very common, and we were very surprised because we also thought that this was an African issue. And this was the thing, it was like this barbaric ritual which is also something you see in the film here, the Bora community is not, this is a very educated, wealthy community. It has nothing to do with barbaric. Um, we found it in northern Iraq, and we thought, and we heard, everybody said it's religion. We do it for religious reasons. So we thought, if this is the case, maybe we also find it in other places. And this is when we founded this campaign, and we looked in Oman, we looked in uh, Iran, we, um, we got in contact with partners in Iran. Uh, they did a lot of studies there, small studies in Malaysia, in Thailand, in uh, Singapore. Um, and this is how, you know, it suddenly popped up. Like, locally, women had been talking about it. But the UN had completely ignored it. And it was such a struggle to get the UN to, to realize this. I mean, we had, I mean, they wouldn't believe us in the beginning. Then we had activists on the ground say, well, call the UN, write them emails, just, you know, fill their mailbox saying this does exist in our countries. And uh, yeah, now they, they, <laughs> they recognized it. Um, what different approaches? Well, I think an approach always has to be local. Uh, we don't have, our concept for approaches, uh, I don't believe 
there can be one approach uh, globally. I think it's, it's always something that has to come out of the local activist community. And uh, yeah, for example, as you see, like um, the Dawoodi Bora in India, they of course will have a very different approach for their community than, for example, uh, we have in northern Iraq with uh, Kurds who live uh, under very poor conditions in villages, are not educated, the women can't read and write. Um, so you need a completely different approach to reach people. Can I just add something to that in terms of approach? Um, yes, I agree. It needs to come from local, obviously, grassroots communities. But we have to remember we are talking about children. I think uh, I go back to my point earlier about using the correct language. Yes, it's called Qatna, FGM, circumcision, but what we are talking about here, it's child abuse. And for me, it's, an, and I'm speaking not just as a campaigner, as a psychotherapist who works with the women, but I'm speaking as a survivor of the practice myself. It's not about the cutting, grabbing a child, pinning them to a table, spreading their legs apart, touching their genitals. To me, you have committed many crimes. I think when, when we, when we uh, for me, uh, uh, that's a different approach we need to, we actually need to call it for what it is and describe it for what it is. Because for me, as a survivor, when, no offense to those who are trying to do the work, when we say, oh, let's talk to community leaders, actually that's not good enough because a community leader, I'm not gonna have a community leader, a religious leader negotiate what happens to my vagina. I refused for that to happen. And we are talking about children. so. The commitment needs to come from political level because I put politicians in place. It's their job to protect me and my child from any form of harm. So I would like to make that very clear. Yeah. So, any more questions from the audience? Um, I mean, you were sitting next to me. I mean, I was literally fidgeting on the chair the whole time because I wanted to jump at the screen. And again, you know, controlling women's bodies and sexuality, again, it's a global issue. And I, I, and I have this conversation, like, when we, I run a, a therapy group for the women, and this is always the theme of our work. But in order to break that, it's actually to create these safe spaces where women can talk about sex and sexual pleasure. And I always say, I'm a great example that FGM never worked because, you know, my sexual urges were supposed to be controlled. That did not work. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, listen, it didn't work. You know, let's just stop practicing it. Here's an example. I was supposed to be <laughs> controlled and, uh, you know, tamed. That didn't happen. And this idea, um, what was what's really interesting, what I found with the women in this video, and I see this in women in my community, apparently there's this, there's this man out there, apparently, that if we see him, we're going to pounce on him <laughs> because we can't control ourselves. I personally would love to meet this guy if he exists. <laughs> so this idea, and, and I think it goes back to our education system. We need to go back to our, I always say our, our education system plays a really key role in terms of about our bodies. Like in the UK, we found recently the clitoris organ is not actually part of the biology books because, you know, God forbid women had to learn about this particular part of their bodies that's quite pleasurable. So for me, it's not just um, ending, breaking that cycle of the way the women are thinking, actually it's going back to the foundation of the system and I go back to policy makers. So until that happens, because for me, FGM won't end until we end all forms of oppression against women. It won't end. You can't end FGM and not end domestic violence or child marriage and all. So to me, it has to come from really, uh, policy makers need to look at our misogynistic policies we have in place first. I don't know if you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think one thing that comes to my mind is you were talking about controlling women's urges. You were saying that women are uh, are you know they're imagined as these um, creatures to jump on men, but actually the same concept is true for men. If you look at certain interpretations of Islam, uh, how they justify that a woman has to wear a headscarf. It's the same thing. They have this concept that the man, if he sees hair, he is out of control and is jumping on women. But he's not the one who's being controlled. It's the woman who's being controlled. Um, yeah. 
And uh, so I think this co the, the FGM does connect to all these issues of, yeah, these concepts of honor. Um, and uh, I want to tell one s short story, which I, which I really liked, what happened in uh, Kurdistan, in um, Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, how changing, how talking about FGM, how talking, and of course in, in the communities we're in, we talk, we start talking about sexual issues, it's all connected. Um, what came out of it? We talked, in this case it was actually um, at, at the, the Anjuman, which is like the mayor of the village, um, who had been involved in this um, thing and he wanted to do something against FGM and we talked to him and he understood okay, this is bad. And then a couple weeks later, he came to the women, our, women uh, our social workers who go to the villages, and he said, you know what, I thought about this. And I realize now this whole thing with like hanging up a bloody sheet after the marriage, this is bogus as well, right? So let's stop this as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's connected. Any more questions? For me, it's not just women's groups. I think, again, I go back to the child. I think all of us have the duty to protect children because, again, when we talk about FGM, we're always focusing on the woman. The woman's afterwards. I, I, I mean, you can see from that video, it happened to them at the age of seven, age of three. I think women's organizations and all human rights organizations play a key role by pushing this message forward, not just at grassroots level, but I, I keep going back to policymakers. What worked in the UK, for example, when I got involved in this campaign, there was a lot of political correctness bullshit that was taking place. No offense, I'm sorry, I'm gonna drop some couple of <laughs> words, okay? <laughs> and there was a lot of, oh, this is religious, this is culture. They used that brush to shut you down. For me, it was, again, and I think that's what I said about the language. So I came in, this westernized diaspora girl, and said, uh, excuse me, isn't this child abuse? <laughs> and as policymakers, where is your role in protecting me as a British citizen? Where is my access to services? Where so for me, campaigners and women's organisation, all we can do is actually push that message forward, but the message has to go not just to communities, it goes straight to policy. In the UK, I, the film that I showed last year, I went after the Home Secretary, Theresa May. I was, running, I was trying to run after her with a vagina costume and vagina cupcakes. <laughs> I was trying to make a point, okay? And the point was, I've been ignored, not because I've undergone FGM, I've, because I'm a woman. The moment you're born as a female, regardless where you go for FGM, you are convicted of something. I don't care if you're Kim Kardashian to Kate, Kim, Kate Middleton to the women, the Bora Muslims to Somali women. The moment you're born as a female, you will be convicted of some sort of violence or oppression. So for me, I always say this, ladies, let's all hold hands, sing Kumbaya together, because we've all been fucked over, basically. <laughs> Yeah, so that's really where I come from. <laughs> Great word to... Uh, to uh, <laughs> Says the Muslim woman in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great word to, to end this discussion and to, to come to the next movie. Do we have uh, time for a short break? Yeah. Ten minutes break. So, and uh, yeah, see you then all here for the next movie. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much.
نیمخن کمتر از خاموشی سیده مخفی بدخشی گذشته است شاعر از سرزمین لعلالا جورد او یکی از پیشگامان شعر زن در افغانستان محسوب می شود و تأثیر جرف بر شاعران زن پس از خود داشته است شعرهای مخفی بدخشی بیانگر بیمهری های زمانش و جامعه سنتی است که با عواطف و احساسات زنانه در تضاد است قید و بندهای جامعه سنتی هنوز هم دیوار بدور عواطف و احساسات زنانگی خیلی از شاعران زن کشیده است بدخشان سرزمین لعل و لاجور زادگاه مخفی بدخشی یکی از شعرهای نامور زبان پارسی دری و از های مطرح شاعران زن در افغانستان سالها پس از خاموشی مخفی بدخشی این دیار ادب پرور شاعر دیگری را در خم و پیش های در رهای زیبایش پرورانیده است گیسوان بلندم را که روزگاری برایت نگاه کرده بودم امروز دست نامردی از پریشانیش لذت میبرد و مرد هر زی شهوتش را تسکین میدهد مردی که دوستش ندارم و هیچ گاه دوستش نخواهم داشت چگونه می شود باور کرد لذت بوسه ای را که بی معنایش اتاقم را تسخیر کرده اوریانی تنم لبریز بی مفهومی و بی خودگی است چشمهایم را باید ببندم این فاجعه تکرار خواهد شد هر شب دستان بی کیف کسی را چگونه باور کنم و شب وحشت که گلوگیر تنهایی است بیدار می کند در من منی که با فریاد به دنیا آمدم و دست هایم نشانه تسلیمی بود به سمت خدا با فریاد نخستین شبم آغاز شد آه اگر من نبودم فریاد ها ناتمام و بی مسیر بودن تا امروز کریمه شبرنگ دختر استبار زحمتگشان در ری دور دست بهارک بدخشان پس از پایان دانشگاه در کاول مجموعه از نوشته ها و اشعارش را چاپ می کند اثر با سبک و سیاق نو و اندیشه های متفاوت کریمه با این اثر به زادگاهش بر می گردد و به عنوان معلم کار می کند بی خبر از این که شعرهایش چه غوغای برپا خواهند کرد در یک حدی بسیار تعداد معدودی که میتونست قبول کنم مرا و او را نمیفهم که ظاهرا برخوردشان همین که بود یا شاید هم در بوتین چیزی دیگه یا برداشت دیگه داشتم که متاسفانه با همین جنجاب که من عطش میزدم بعد از که رفتم برخشان با همو برخورد رو برو هم شدم کریمه و شعرهایش شهره شهر شد و زبان زده خاص و عام. اده از مذهبی های متعصب او را تهدید به مرگ کردند. در اکثر نوشته ها با ما مخالف ملاهای محله ما بوده که مثلا ای را رب دادن به شریعت و ای گپار هم رب دادن به مسائل اخلاقی گویا ما یک آدمی بد اخلاق بودیم و یک آدمی کاملا کافر بودیم و هیچ همین گونه برخورد های در اکثر این شعرها نهفته هست که خواننده دقیق اگر نباشه بسیار زود منحرف میشه و بعد قضاوت برعکس می داشته باشه در قبال من نه در حامله ها که حتی شمار از تحصیل کرده ها و نویسندگان بدخشان نیست نتوانستند کریمه و شعرهایش را تحمل کنند 
آنها هم او را به گفرگویی و تلاش برای بیراه کشاندن زنان دیگر محکوم کردند. یک مقدار از شعره هاشان توهین و یا برزش های دینی و شایر دینی برمیخورد و در شرایط کنونی و در عصر کنونی برای مردم افغانستان و خصوصا برای مردم بدخشان چینین شعره ها باعث می شود که فرهنگ بی حیایی یا فرهنگ غیر اخلاقی در افغانستان و در جامعه گسترش پیدا بکنم مجموعه فراسوی بدنامی با واکنش هایی که در پیداش به مجموعه از بدنامی کریمه در محل زیست او بدل شد خانواده کریمه نیز از آسیب های فراسوی بدنامی به نصیب نماند تعدید های روزفزون عرصه را برای این مرد تنگ کرد تصمیم گرفت دخترش را برای در امان ماندن از دانه های مردم به کابل بفرستد ولی بالای نفس شعر موضوعی سکی پذیرش جامعه مشکل است او چیزی را که ایده آل ماست او چیزی که در ذهنی ما میگرده در فکر ما میگرده برداشتش اکثرا تحمل نداره نوگذری های هست در این جامعه ما که تحمل همچو اشاری را این محیط نداره دیگه یک جره کابل باز آزادتر فضاش دیگه چه میتونه که اما درد دلش در کاغذ بریزم خب با این همی برخورت های اجتماعی بود که وقتی مرا نمیخواست اجتماعی از او و به اندازه بود که گفته بودن اگر یادم بیشتر در اینجا باشه شاید دیگه دخترها هم فاسد شود دیگه دخترها هم مثلا با این وقت بشینه و بخیزه آدم خوبی و از او در نیایم البته با قضاوت از این کتاب و به اندازه که همیشه مثلا پشت خانه ما نفرهای بود یا از طرف شب یا از طرف روز یا در مسیری رای که میرفتم یا حتی خانواده در مجموع خواهرها یا برادرای خورتر از ما وقتی بیرون میبرن اومدن میگفتن ای مثلا خواهر فلان آدم از اونم آدم دیگه و خودتون میفهمین که کی هستن که تا یکی از خواهرای که از ما خورتر است به اندازه ای حرفا بالاش تاثیر کرده بود که حالا یک آدمی به تمام معنا افسرده و کاملا یک آدمی حالت روحیش هیچ خوب نیست این رقم یک برخورد ها بعد باعث شد که چون بیشتر جدی شدی مسائل ما دیگه نتونستم که در روز با شما اومدم اینجا کریمه به کابل باز می گردد. شهری که او در آن اندیشه هایش را در قالب شعر بیان کرد و خاطرات خوشی از این شهر دارد. با برادرش که در یکی از ادارات دولتی معمور است در شهر کافل زندگی می کند. قاری سیف الرحمن یگانه حامی و سرپرست کریمه در اینجا است. همانند سایر زنان در افغانستان کریمه مسئولیت کار خانه را نیز به عهده دارد شعر می سراید مطالعه می کند و یا هم به کارهای خانه مشغول است یک جامعه سنتی جامعه ما ممکن است تعداد زیادی است زنهای باشن که استعدادهای بسیار خوب و تبع بسیار خوب و فورانی داشته باشن اما از طرف خانواده هایشان مشکلاتی برشان هست که نتوانستن اما احساسات خود باستا بتن همیشه شاعران زن وقتی به این مثلا مصروف ساخته شون و مشغول ساخته شون اونا نمیتونن به جایگاه هم برسن که باز هم اونا نمیتونن آنچه که خودشان از صداقتشان از او را بیان کنن در افغانستان بسیار چیزها در واقعیت زندگی ما وجود داره بخشی از زندگی ما است ولی وقتی که ما در ادبیات او را بیان بکنیم مورد سرزنش و شماعتت قرار میگیریم 
از جمله مثلا حسی غریزی غریزه هایی که انسان داره و انسان ناچار است که این غریزه ها را بیان بکنه ولی وقتی که اگر کسی بیان بکنه او مورد ملامتی قرار میگه و این مربوط میشه به موز ذهنیت بسته جامعه میشه من امین لحظه میخوام بگم که یک شاعره است به نام کریمه شبرنگ یک مجموعه شعر داره به نام فراسوی بدنامی بازم برمیگرده به بدخشان این نزدیکی را کشته بودن و این فرار که داله آمده کابل فقط به خطر این گونه شعرهایش که از از چی میگه از خود میگه و از مثلا از زیبایی های یک زن گپ میزن جامعه ما همیشه سنتی بوده و همیشه حق مرد داشته زن در هیچ جایگاه اصلا در زندگیش نداشته در تمام مورد حتی صلاحیت هیچ چیزی را زن نداشته حتی امو وجود فیزیکی را که خودش داره صلاحیت امو را زن نداشته در اجتماع ما بنابراین اندیشه هایشون یا از طرف اجتماعی یا از طرف خودش بنا بر ترس هایی که وجود داشته بیم هایی که وجود داشته بیان نمی شده و این جای خالی که از گذشته تا امروز در شعر زن افغانستان وجود داشته ما نمی خواهیم که ما هم ادامه کار امو زن هایی باشم که همیشه نقاب گذاشتن و همیشه مثلا از هویتشان از بودنشان این کار کردن با دیدگاه هایی که در اندیشه ما هست و در مجموع اندیشه ما آینده چندان خوبی برای خودم نداره که توقع از او داشته باشم البته در زندگی روزانه را منظورم هست نه آینده سالهای بعد یا نسلهای پس از ما چون دیدگاهی هست که واقعا غیر قابل تحمل است یعنی اجتماع امروزی ما نمیتونه این همی دیدگاه را حضم بکنه و ای اساس ما به خطر زندگی روزانه خودم واقعا نگران هستم و بسیار زیاد دشوار هم هست زندگی کردم برم در شرایط و به همین ترتیب آینده از این هم آینده چندان خوبی نیست که بتونه قناعت بخش باشه برم وضعیتی که ما دارم یا مثلا وضعیتی که اجتماعی ما داره بنابرای برداشت از اجتماع یا از جامعه خودمان آینده بسیار زیاد وحشتناک را برای خود میبینم پیغمبران و شهوت از دیاری کدام این خدا تنت را این گونه تسخیر کردن دست هایت را ساده به دست کسی نگذار مفهوم سرنوشت من در خطوط دستان تو پیچیده است تو در خیش نسترن به کار برای من تنت را برهنه می خواهم بر تن خیش تمام تاریکی شب را می نوشم به اعتماد دستان تو یک نفس تنت را به من ببخش تا لذت سکوت را بنوشی ای همه هستی تنم نسارت و نوازش شانه ها یمزان تو باد پله های گناه مجموعه شعری دیگر از کریم شب رنگ است که قرار است به زودی چاپ شود. تمام نوشته های ما از دید اجتماعی ما گناهگار است، گناه آلود است. به اساس ما خواستیم که عبور از این همی پله ها باید به شکل همو گناه آلودی که اونا تعبیر دارن باشه. و پله های گناه آلود هم پر از اونمو حرف است که مردم اجتماعی ما بر از او گناهگار میگن و شخصا بر خودم یک آدم کافر و گناهگار میگن شب تو شروع نمی شود جغرافی های آغوش تو امشب نزدیک تر از نگاه خداست در پیره هنم با یک بوسه به نوش من را و شب را دستانت حیران می شوند در بیمرزی گریبانم اگر قدم برداری خواب خانه را خدا را به حال خودش بگذار هرچند می دانم همیشه لبریز از سرانه های اوریان من است و کافلی سرد سیاهی را می راند از قبیله نهایت هستی ما شب به تو شروع نمی شود نگاه کن محتاب خیانت نکند که بسترم پر از تراوت لب توست و اتاقمت را دوستت دارم پنجره را ببند تا هیچ ستاره ای نبیند گناهکاری اتاق را اگر خدا نامه را ما نمی بیند 
این دو آغوش لخت زوق زده را چشم های نحسش را به هیچ می انگاریم شب بی تو شروع نمی شود بیا بشکن سکوت بسترم را Because I'm Nina, I'm an Iranian filmmaker, and um, actually the first time I saw this movie, it, it reminded me of uh, something that happened to me as a child. Um, I used to love drawing when I was growing up. Um, one of the things I used to love to draw was this figure of a woman with wings and dresses, and the dress was my favorite part. I would, these kind of elaborate gowns I would draw on her, like spaghetti you know, straps or off the shoulder. And I remember one time in school, the teacher took my drawing, folded it in half, and told me to never draw that. I was never allowed to draw that, and that was indecent. Now, I explained to a seven-year-old why something that was so innocent and brought so much joy was indecent. And for me, this story was, it's, was so important because as, when you look at art, whether it's paintings or music or poetry, we never think about the artist. We never think that this is an expression of them, expression of their thoughts, of their feelings, of their emotions. And when you censor that, when you censor a piece of art, you're not censoring the artist, you're censoring their thoughts, their emotions, you're saying that it's invalid, that it doesn't count. You're taking away their voice. And when you censor based on their gender, you're taking away their identity and their humanity as well. So, for me, the, I wanted this m movie to be in this festival because for me, I wanted to give her a voice. I wanted to make sure that she knew that she mattered, that her voice mattered, that her emotions counted, that her thoughts and feelings were valid. And I just want to say to all you artists out there, whether in this room or in cyberspace, don't ever let anyone censor you, whether it's religious leaders, family members, critics, and if they try, fuck them. Because you know what? Yeah. It's about you, it's about your voice, and you gotta damn make sure it gets heard. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Fatima Sabri. I am a student in the US, I'm doing my master's. I'm, I would say I have done few things in, um, I mean, as a woman activist. I would not call myself as an activist because I have a very long way to go. But as an undergrad student, I wrote a senior thesis on sexual harassment on public places of Afghanistan. And after I graduated, I, I and one of my colleagues, we decided to have a campaign about sexual harassment um, like in public places. And we started that from our, uh, the ministry that I worked in. It was really hard using the word sexual harassment because every time I tried to interview people and I wanted to talk to talk to people about my, um, about this issue of sexual harassment, they would say, oh, can you, can you use another word instead of sexual harassment? Because we, we really don't want to use the word sexual because it touches upon the taboo concept, which is like women's sexuality, and we don't want to deal with that. And so this has been coming up so many times. So this movie, it just, it struck me. I, I can't say how I feel right now because it's really hard. Her words, the words that she uses in her poetry, they are really taboo. We can't really talk about those things. So, but I think it's really important because that's how she feels. And she, through her poetry, it's not just about her poetry and giving a voice. She talks about women's oppression. And I guess that's really important that we all get together and talk about that.
Are there any questions from the oh, okay. Um, I Trying to recap, or you want to do it in Farsi, or <laughs> so um, she was. She was talking about um, that the movie um, that the movie was foc focusing on tradition, but um, she said that um, that the life in Kabul um, 50 years ago, or the situation for women in Kabul 50 years ago, was very different <coughs> from from what it's looking like um, right now. Mm -hmm. So that we should just not focus on, on on traditional issues, but also about about um, power that, that comes with us. Uh. And um, she, she um, if I understand you correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that it's that it was not not so much included in the movie about um, uh, um, contemporary um, um, problems with with power. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, during my mom's time in Iran, I mean, women had careers, they had, you know, amazing jobs, they were head of companies and, you know, everything, and when the Islamic regime came, I mean, she had a high, power, my mom had a very high power job, and when the whole regime came, they took all that away. Um, one of the, actually, uh, one of my favorite singers, Gugush, who was considered like the superstar back then, and she, once the regime came, she wasn't allowed to sing for 20 years. After 20 years, she was able to finally get a visa to leave the country. And she's one of the biggest superstars again, I'm happy to say, in California. But yeah, so it's, it's not a tradition. It's not, you know, this just happened when the regime came into these countries. Any more questions? Social media, spread the word. <laughs> you got, you saw the film, you know, just Twitter it, Instagram it, whatever else there's out there. I don't know. <laughs> just yeah. So I think right now we we're so fortunate to have that, to have all these kind of mediums that we could spread things like this so quickly. I would say if we try to find, I mean, if we try to find somebody who is connected to her, like the person who made this doc. Uh, documentary if we can reach out to him and then ask him to like get us in contact with her so that her uh, I mean her poetry will be translated into English so that the people around the world would know and then she feels supported and I do really want to say that how her family was really supportive of her so we should really not forget the importance of having <coughs> support from their families so it's 
I think I, if, it, if it's somebody from Afghanistan, I would try my best to find. And then, but there's one problem with this social media because some people just don't use Facebook or Twitter or they don't even know what Facebook or Twitter is. So there is our challenge. So, but yeah, we can try to spread the word and find people from the same country and try to reach them. I just want to make, thank you for bringing up the filmmaker. So you'll see in your program that he's listed, his name is Ramat Ansari, and um, he is an Afghan filmmaker who um, actually is living today in Dresden. Um, he escaped Afghanistan and fled to Taliban, had death threats on his life, um, and he left with his family, and he doesn't know where his family is right now. They were separated in Turkey, and he's been trying to find them. Um, his story is incredible. He all the German friends, please help him stay here if possible, because we do need more men like him on our side, <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, um, are there any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. I don't know, for the ladies, or you, if you're uh, familiar with the film, I was wondering about um, whether the woman published these poems by herself, who published it, and um, how important the role of the, the, the male authentication is in that sense, or if somebody didn't step in for her and vouch for her in order to, for her to get this uh, stuff into the public. Should I do that? <laughs> I'm sure she, I mean, she's really powerful and she had all those written. I, I, I personally don't know how she dealt with all those things, but I guess the first thing that was her father is really supportive. And then we saw one man who is actually a very famous poet in Afghanistan. And he was the one who said that her life is in danger. So I think he was, he is one of the ones who is, like, is still like really supportive of her, but I, I don't know if Paula has more information or you have. I know, I'm, I'm, I would think that she probably published this herself. Or, um, I mean, I know in Iran there's a lot of underground publishing companies. I don't know in Afghanistan if it's the same, but I would assume she probably did it herself. Yeah. But I would say in Afghanistan, if you don't have, like, if you don't have support, you can't just go to do these things. So I'm sure that her family and her, there are people who are supportive of her poetry. Exactly. Yeah, so we saw that her book was actually a book. So she went to a uh, publishing company and I um, I would be like I wouldn't I wouldn't be wrong if I say that the publisher is a man. So yeah, <laughs> she does have a support from that. So I have questions. Well, um, when I saw the um, the guys um, speaking out against her poems, um, who were writers um, themselves, like um, the guy was a journalist or the other one a writer, would you say that um, that they are speaking out against her not not just because of the content of her poems, but also because they feel threatened by her in, in terms of that it's that they feel like the competition that someone is that a woman is coming, um, women is coming into her into their field and and and, and threaten them. I think th men are thrown by us in general, in all aspects. And I think that's one of the biggest issues. Um, that's why we have all these problems. So um, <clears throat> I, think that's, I think that's the core of it all, yes. And then of course there's the whole sexual content, which is so taboo. Um, but to me the whole the concept of being threatened by us, I think, I think that is the major issue, and that is why we are being suppressed. Because if you think about it, we carry life. They can't do that. And we could do it without them. We don't really need them. We just need to test you. <laughs> so that alone, that's, I think that is the biggest threat, is the fact that we carry life. They don't. And that's what it comes down to. In her particular case, I think it's uh, a lot of uh, this has to do with her, the content of her poetry. Because, I mean, 
I know the language and I know how people's mentality are. And I just couldn't hear it because all my life I didn't hear those things. It's really, really hard to hear those things because in our daily life, we in our schools, we just don't talk about our bodies. And she talks about forced marriage, our bodies, and uh, their, how they feel. Like the feelings are usually the things that we don't talk. So it's mostly people want to shut, shut her down because she really touches upon the t taboo topics. All right, then. Um no more questions from the audience? I think we have another break for, let's say, 10 minutes. And um, if, you, if you go out there, you, you'll find a table where you can, um, where you can purchase um, uh, the movie on the diaries. I mean, we're going to screen it here, but it's, uh, it's a more, more extended version that you can purchase um, out there. OK, so. I have a question. Are these movies, I mean, are we allowed to uh, screen them somewhere else? Yeah, it, it depends on each film and the distribution of each film, but I'm glad you brought that up because there's a live stream right now that's happening on the Build website, so some of the films are even being screened right now. So all of you in the room, you know, see Facebook posts, all those great things, and then each film has its own particular rules. rules. So, okay, we'll see you back in 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you very much.
The current status of Christians and other non-Muslim minorities throughout the Middle East is the worst it's been in centuries. 21 people were killed when a powerful bomb exploded in front of a Coptic Christian church. Muslim mobs began attacking Christian churches. They are targeting churches, temples, cultural, historical sites. I converted from Islam to Christianity. I was arrested and after that they gave me a death penalty. What I told the judge in this day, if loving and worshipping Christ is a crime, I am guilty as charged. The Christians of Iraq and Syria who fled ISIS narrowly escaped a genocidal campaign of mass murder, of crucifixions, and of beheadings. Now we are here in Ankawa Center for Yath. Uh, we have here uh, 186 caravan, 260 families here. What is taking place in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq, is genocide. They call this ethnic cleansing. This is the real world. The administration is failing, the Congress is failing, and quite frankly, with all due respect, the church is failing. In response to persecution, I always want to tell people to pray. Stop, pray, be burdened for your brother and sister, but get involved in the fight and help. And doesn't matter how small is your voice, you can make a difference, even if you are just one person. If I was to explain the concept of honor as a personal experience, I would say this. I was 14 years old and I came home from school. My mother sat me down. She presented me with a photograph of the man that I was to learn I was promised to from the age of eight. My family took me out of education and I was held a prisoner at home for a number of weeks until I agreed to the marriage. And I did purely to buy about my freedom and I ran away from home. My mother said to me, you either come home and marry who we say, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. So we were taught that as young women, we had the power to dishonor our family because the reputation and the honor of the family, the position was invested in our behavior. concept of honor, it's very difficult to explain it to Western societies. A lot of it has to do with how women behave and the sexuality of women. Predominantly, women are conditioned to adhere to a set of honor codes within the family where they are taught not to shame the family and dishonor the family. Honor is something that is carried and contained in women and is there to be guarded by men. A woman has to be controlled. She has to be sexually submissive until it's time for her to be married. The honor system that exists in many cultural societies is really the basis of a lot of harm that is perpetuated against women. Their lives are not their own and their bodies are not their own. The lashing because of dress. This is a punishment of a humiliation. In some cases, they even control women's movements, as in Saudi Arabia. Deprived of basic rights, such as a driver's license. I'm educated, I have a job. I should be trusted to drive my own car. 
Serious sexual harassment and attacks on women in Egypt. Groping, stripping and rapes have become increasingly frequent. A mutilation of the body, acid violence. There has been a wave of killings specifically targeting girls who study or women who work. There's a terrible fear of the educated, empowered woman. I have the right of education, I have the right to play, I have the right to sing, I have the right to talk, I have the right to go to market. I have the right to speak up. The Taliban targeted 15-year-old Malala Yousafzai and her friends. He asked for Malala by name, and then he shot her. This is one of the most alarming human rights issues in the world. For too long, we've pushed these issues under the carpet. The more we say, OK, it's a fringe, the more we kind of come up with all kinds of arguments that help us do nothing about the situation, that what we're really doing is just looking away. In order to help these women, we need to present a united front because we have strength in solidarity. We have strength in numbers. My name is Rahil Raza. I was uh, born in Pakistan. I am a Pakistani by birth. I'm a Canadian by choice. And Islam is my spiritual journey. I'm a public speaker. I'm a journalist. I'm a writer. And I'm an advocate for women's rights. Jasmine de Sanguera. I'm a campaigner against forced marriages and honor based abuse in the UK. I'm Nazi Eftakari. I work with a number of human rights organizations regarding the matter of human rights in Iran and the region. My name is Fahima Abdel Hafiz Hashim. I have been working since 1997 in Sudan, mainly focusing on women's rights issues. My name is Raquel Saraswati. I am an activist and I write about the abuses of women in the Muslim world and, and worldwide. My name is Nazanin Afshinjam. I'm a human rights activist and I focus a lot on women's rights issues. My name is Juliana Taimorazi and I'm the founder of the Iraqi Christian Relief Council. Our mission is to raise awareness amongst Americans about the plight of the Iraqi Christians. My name is Manda Zan Irvin. I'm an activist for the human rights of Iranian women and children. My name is Zan Al Khan. I'm a therapist and I work primarily with South Asian women who are survivors of domestic violence. The treatment of women worldwide is definitely a cause of concern because there are many societies in which women are oppressed. But the issue of women in Muslim majority societies is definitely a huge human rights concern. So we came up with this idea to bring activist women together and talk about ways and ideas in which we could support the women of Islamic Muslim societies. The honor of a family is vested in a woman's body. The honor of a family is vested in what she does and what she says. His honor is connected to what she does and says. It's a misplaced sense of honor. It's a um, harmless word uh, replacing control of male over female. For me and for the girls and boys, because we support boys too, when they give voice to honor, straight away it unlocks Pandora's box. Change can only happen through dialogue. If we don't talk about the abuses taking place, Nothing will change. I'm excited to introduce our next guest because she is a multi talented woman. No ordinary author. She's a Miss World finalist. Nazneen formed a group called Stop Child Executions. Iran is under a gender apartheid. 
and women's lives are literally valued as being half of a man. There's nothing more powerful than a group of women coming together and sharing their experiences and taking action. And that's why I was so pleased in that salon setting to meet other women who are working on different issues for women's rights because we need an army. We need a whole army of women helping other women. In the Iran that I grew up in, uh, my grandmother never wore a veil, my mother never wore a veil, women went to universities, women were judges, doctors, cabinet members, and then came 1978, the so-called revolution. Women were immediately washed off the public arena. All the rights that Iranian women had gotten through those years were taken away. I remember the men, you know, I remember distinctly the men saying things like, what difference does it make if you symbolically wear a little piece of cloth on your head? Um, what's important is democracy, what's important is freedom. I remember even at the time saying to them, are you crazy? Are you <laughs> crazy? It makes the world of difference compelling me to wear a piece of cloth, as you say, on my head. Why don't you wear a turban on your head and walk around all day? It's subjugation. Thousands of women have been detained for dressing un-Islamically. Like this woman screaming as she's pushed into a police car. As a woman, you are stripped of all of your freedoms. For women, it becomes it was almost a matter of daily life. If we look only at Saudi Arabia, the cradle of Islam, women are completely disadvantaged. In Saudi Arabia, women are denied the right to even appear publicly without a male guardian. Mm -hmm. By law, they have the power to stop you from leaving the house, from working, from choosing your own mate. When we talk about the oppression of Muslim women, it is the, their whole community, their families, their religion is putting all kinds of constraints on the individual woman's sexuality. You know, the woman's body is the sort of barometer of, of progress and uh, piety and, you know, extremism. Everything has to do with what we are wearing, where we are working, whom we are working with, control of women's bodies in all senses. Female genital cutting. Most commonly done before puberty, some young girls will have their clitoris completely removed to preserve their virginity. Female genital mutilation is not advocated in Islam in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't appear in the Quran, but has very much been adopted by some Muslim societies. It's going everywhere in the world where the Muslim Brotherhood goes. It can cause bleeding, infection, infertility, and even death. It, it cannot be compared to male circumcision. It is very different. It is to limit the sexuality of, um, of the female. Circumcision is healthy for girls. I know this. Purified girls grow taller and get marriage proposals, but unpurified girls stay short and stubby. Circumcision is the reason why Muslim women are virtuous, unlike Western women who run after their sexual appetite in any place with any man. We are seeing more cases of female genital mutilation in the US, in Canada, and in UK. So it has been imported into the West as a cultural practice. It happens to about 6,000 girls every day. It's a plague, it's an epidemic. In my family, 
my cousins were just going for circumcision the next day. So everybody was preparing food and they're making big uh, event. So I was in my uncle's house. So I, I went, I had small booklets on how harmful circumcision is. Mm -hmm. And I sneaked up to his room and I gave him the books. Mm -hmm. And I told him, don't do that. You know what happened? He came because his eldest daughter was circumcised. He came crying. And he really asked his daughter to, to, to forgive him, and he refused for the, the other two to be circumcised the next day. The lashback I got from my mom that how dare me to talk about these issues to men, oh. <laughs> yeah. you know? And sometimes they are the ones who just give in to all the stereotypes, yeah. and they, yeah. you know, they actually accept some of the abuse that's told out to them. I've had yeah. many women say, no, it's okay, I'm happy to be this way. You know, yeah, I'm happy to be submissive. Yeah. I'm happy uh, that someone else tells me what to do. It's important to say that women are helping to perpetuate these things by committing some of the acts, but at this point, it is still a game of survival. When a woman is raising her daughter, she knows that there are consequences for not following a particular order. This embedded patriarchy, mm. the power and the politics mm. is such a lethal combination. Mm. When we're talking about the root cause of addressing gender disparity and empowering women, we do have to look at child marriages. Nijud Ali is every inch a child, and yet at just 10, she has already been married and divorced. I didn't want to sleep with him, but he forced me to. He hit me and insulted me. She was beaten and raped and turned to her own family for mercy. Nijud got her divorce, but based on the principles of Sharia law, her husband was compensated, not prosecuted. There's a, a real kind of a lack of an understanding of what women and girls face once they're forced into a marriage, right? I mean, these marriages are consummated through rape. During sex, I was crying and begging him to stop, but he didn't listen. Then he put his hand on my mouth like this. I couldn't breathe, and I was crying, but he used me anyway. It happened to me. I was supposed to marry my cousin because it's the norm in the family. And when I said, no, I don't love him, my family, I mean, the men in the family were laughing. They said, love? What do you mean by saying you don't love him? Uh, and I said, no, and I continued. They came every day for three years, every day, to check if I have changed my mind. So then after three years, my uncle stood and said, you know, if you are not going to marry him, you are going to really make us feel that we have no right of over anyone in this family. And if you do it, means that we cannot ask any other woman to be forced to get married to someone. I said, why do you want to force them at the first place? My parents were Sikh, so my family's religion was Sikhism. And I'm one of seven sisters, and the majority of us were born here in Britain. And I watched the majority of my sisters being taken out to British schools when they were 15 years old to marry men they'd only have met in photographs. They would have long absences, which were never questioned. And they would return back to the UK as somebody's wife. My sister, Rubina, was telling me how unhappy she was in her marriage. Um, and I said to her, come to me. And she said, I can't because I have to think about honor. She didn't want to dishonor the family by leaving her husband and divorcing him. But my sister, in the end, took her own life. She set herself on fire, Rubina did, and she died. It's more honorable to do that than to dishonor your family by leaving your husband.
For me, that was a big turning point in my life. My experience and Rubina's experience, I channeled that energy into Karma Nirvana. Good afternoon, Karma Nirvana. Karma Nirvana is now a national charity. We are an organisation that supports victims of forced marriages and honour crimes. Currently, we are receiving in the region of 600 calls a month. Last year, we supported 6,500 people on the helpline. 65% of our callers to our helpline are Pakistani Muslim. We also deal with Kurdish, Iranian, Somalian community who again also share the Islamic faith. The other percentages are Sikh. Feel the injustice of a five-year-old girl in Britain today being forced into a marriage. We are constantly going out there across the UK raising awareness amongst professionals and we lobby Parliament. It is necessary to make this a crime because it's an absolutely abhorrent practice. It is frankly little short of slavery. The issue of forced marriage and non-abuse is a worldwide problem. This is happening across the, the European countries, it's happening in Sweden, in Italy, in France, Belgium, Holland. This is happening definitely in Britain. In the United States, there is no doubt in my mind you have a big problem. And the problem also is made worse by the fact that you're not looking at it. And it's so hidden, that means your victims are hidden. That means the perpetrators are getting away with this. There needs to be a light shone on this in America because there's no doubt we're dealing with a tiny dot of what is going on in the United States. A mother and father accused of dousing their teenage daughter in acid. Her crime looking at a boy. She turned to look at him. I told her before not to do that. I started beating her. Then her mother brought the acid. It was her destiny to die this way. In the case of honor killing, um, Often when these crimes happen, it is because the young woman has been seen as bringing some kind of shame or dishonor to the family, and that is generally because of some perceived sexual impropriety or um, break from the social code. After five years of abuse, Gulmina finally gathered the courage to leave her husband in Pakistan. Days later, her brother struck his own sister 15 times, cutting open her face, head and parts of her body. What also constitutes shame is people were talking badly of her, even if she didn't really do anything forbidden within that context and in that culture. For bringing shame to the family, her own husband cut off her nose and ears. She's perceived as less pure and therefore worthy of death um, in order to restore the image of sexual purity to the family. As a Christian woman, we lived in Muslim countries for centuries, obviously, mm -hmm. but we didn't adapt to honor killing. So I don't think this is cultural, I think it's more religious, because we didn't have that in our communities. Juliana, Juliana let me ask you one thing, though. Um, you grew up in Iran for, for many years. Mm -hmm. In your family or those around you, did the word Aberu ever come up? Like, the idea of, oh, don't do that, it might sure, shame, yeah. what, what bring shame to the family. Yes, or... but not to the point of killing somebody. No, not, not to the point of, of killing not. someone. To, just to point out what you said about it, it being religious, it isn't. The reason being is that this idea of honor and honor killing is embedded in Sikh, Hindu, uh, you know, it has been there not mm -hmm. only in Muslim societies, in, you know, in, in these South Asian communities. South Asian culture has sort of perpetuated this, but then, you know, in the Arab world, it exists as well.
I don't think people are, are aware of just how prevalent it is and that it is happening in the United States, that it's increasing here and that it's not such a fluke when it does happen. Her parents beat her after seeing her with a boy. The police are saying the teen was abused because she didn't want to go through with an arranged marriage. Georgia police say he strangled his daughter to protect his family's honor. Muzamal Hassan is accused of beheading his wife after she filed for divorce. And allegedly run down by her own father for becoming too westernized. All murderers in the eyes of a Canadian court. A jury convicted Mohammed Shafia, his wife Tuba, and their son Hamed of killing three of the Shafia's daughters, along with Mohammed's first wife, Rona. One of the reasons that the, the, <clears throat> there was a conviction in this case was because of those wiretaps. And, and one said, this is what a daughter should be? Would a daughter be such a whore? I say to myself, you did well. Would they come back to life a hundred times? You do the same again. Even if they hoist me up on the gallows, God will see I'm not left without honor. Nothing is more important than our honor. The, the causes of crisis have everything to do with the part of tradition and religion, which are clearly about the oppression of women. It's, it's the honor system. This is being done in the name of some ideology that is full of violence and hatred. Whenever there is a rise in religiosity, the crux of it falls on the women, and a lot of the violence is justified through faith. Why is it that everybody is afraid to say that Muslim women are deprived of their humanity? We shy away from criticizing anything that's different um, because we don't want to be seen as the type of people who would restrict people's expression. You know, and I, and I think that that's very, very well motivated. They fear treading on cultural toes, and we're constantly having to remind them that cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. Abraham Lincoln freed American slaves. I look at the women under the Islamic rules as a slaves to a dictatorial, theocratic regime that does not consider them human. I have learned that being an activist is a lonely life. Nobody wants to touch the issue of the human rights of women under the Islamic rules and dictatorships. Muslim women are being ignored, not only by Muslim men, by the whole world. And the United Nations Human Rights Council is a perfect example of where issues of women don't get the forefront. Iran and Saudi Arabia are both vying for seats on UN Women, an agency to give women and girls a stronger voice. You look at who's on the UN Human Rights Council. When I was there a few years ago, Libya had joined, and Iran is there. To allow the regime in Iran, or any of these countries, that are gross and habitual violators of the rights of their own citizens, and, you know, are symbols of misogyny, to serve on UN commissions and UN committees, is just a travesty. I mean, I'd say it's a joke, except it's not funny at all. Islam is a source of strength for me. It is a source of peace for me. It is where I go to ask my most critical questions. It is what I'm told by others is the reason for so much evil. But it is the thing that makes me feel like I can fight that evil. Anyone who's doing meaningful work in this field will receive his, his hostility and threats. There are, you know, comments that come in via email, poor bag, burn in hell, that sort of thing. And so most of that I can tolerate, but then, it, then things take a different turn. There are threats of murder, there are threats of rape, physical mutilation. 
I am certainly in fear when I receive an email threatening to sexually assault me. It's you know, connected to your value as a woman. It's connected to your bodily integrity. It gets very serious and it gets very scary. It's when it gets to you know, these sort of very, very real things is when it's, is when it's harder. Oftentimes people say to me, well, Nazanin, you get death threats and different you know, discouraging emails. Why do you continue doing what you do? And I say, you know what? I live in a, country, a free country. I have freedom of expression. I can do whatever I want. It's the least I can do to speak right. up for those on the inside who are facing this at a, on a daily basis and who really get the threats and who are in real position mm -hmm. of being targeted. What I've learned over the years is that to be afraid is to give in to them. And that's something I will never do. Mm, exactly. Because if I'm afraid, they win. What someone said to me recently, um, it was very sweet. She's an older woman. She said, it's very easy to break a twig or a stick. But when you bundle them together, mm -hmm. you can't break that. And I think it's a, it's a sort of li a lie to say that I'm not afraid. No. I'm afraid no. all the time. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't also be courageous. And by you being courageous, it allows another person to stand up and be courageous. And again, one by one, it creates an ocean of change. You know, these last two days, we have addressed some issues that I have never been able to address with groups before. Issues that are controversial, challenging, taboo. We need to pick up from here and continue this dialogue when we go back with people that we know. You know, there should be no taboos. We live in a country where we have freedom of voice. Right. Let's utilize it to its utmost and not be intimidated by those who want to shut us up. The continuation of this dialogue is to let women speak about this with the support of men and women of other faiths, of other cultures, other communities, because without them, we cannot make a change. Violence against women and girls is perhaps the most systematic, widespread human rights violation in the world. And today, from Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, women are insisting that their full rights be enshrined as their new constitutions are being written. From Bahrain to Egypt, women have raised their voices and their fists in demanding universal rights. They were there at the front lines, shoulder to shoulder with the men in Tahrir. By women in Saudi Arabia campaigning for the right to thrive. My grandmother told my mother step by step. My mother told me step by step. There's no way on earth will I tell my daughter step by step. We're impatient and we want to change. We're fighting till the, the last moment to forget all our rights, to claim all our rights. It's, it's one package and we're not negotiating it. It's unnegotiable. There has never been a better time than now to turn the tide and to actually find solutions for the problems that are faced. How would we feel if these were our sisters? Our daughters, our mothers. There are so many unmet needs and so much yet to be done, and there's a lot of great efforts, but we have very, very far to go. Under the Taliban, almost no girls went to school. Now, nearly three million do. The Taliban shot me on the left side of my forehead. They thought that the bullet would silence us, but they failed. And out of their silence came thousands of voices. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. It would be wonderful if all women's organizations understood what this is about and how large it can be. People of all backgrounds need to pay attention to this and really understand that they can get involved, they can do their part, they can voice their opinion, and they can truly make a difference. We will speak up for our rights, and we will bring change to our voice. We don't need sympathy, empathy, pity. We don't need the Nobel Prize. We don't need to be Time's Woman of the Year. We don't need any of that. We need systematic change in the Muslim world. So millions of women are not daily victims.
victims of misogyny. Systematic, institutionalized misogyny. Since you uh, produced the movie, um, tell us about a little bit about the, the impact, about the reaction that you got. Yeah, well, one of the major consequences is w what we're all doing here today. So um, really, Honor Diaries was the start of the movement. And we always said, all the women and men that were part of the film, we always said, we don't want Honor Diaries to be just a movie. We want it to be a movement as well. And having and founding the Censored Women's Film Festival is part of that movement because it's not enough if Honor Diaries is the only film that's out there. It's about making sure that other filmmakers and that other women and men um, who are so brave to speak out against these topics make sure to have their voices heard. Um, just a couple of other anecdotes about the film. So. Since Honor Diaries came out in 2014, um, the Department of Justice in the United States published a report on honor-based violence, one of the first of its kind, and actually cited Honor Diaries in a couple of other films. Um, so I, I bring that up because I think film really does have an impact in trying to move the needle on these conversations. Um, and we've also seen um, some increased attention on FGM in the United States and, of course, around the world. And we've shown the film at the House of Commons um, in the UK and also at the UN in Geneva and New York. And, I mean, Raheel can speak to the hundreds of screenings that she's been to as well and presented at. Um, so, yes, I've uh, traveled across 100 campuses in North America with this film showing it at college campuses to students. And, uh, you know, I had mentioned earlier on this morning that um, our mandate is to, to expose the problems, to educate the masses, and then eradicate. And I think since Honor Diaries was released, we really have exposed the problem because it's picked up in so many parts of the world. I'm from Pakistan, where they now have a law against um, honor killings. In Canada, we were able to bring in a law which is called zero tolerance for barbaric practices. In uh, Sweden, they want to legislate that uh, honor-based violence should be a separate category, category under the law. And I've been working with the UK Parliament to have exactly this sp specific um, uh, legal uh, part of it that make honor-based violence uh, part of it. So it really is, is all-consuming. Um, it's not just a documentary. It has been, a, 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 you know, taken over my life and our lives and uh, interacted in many of it, amazing ways. Grassroots organizations have contacted us. And I mean, the work continues. It's not as though this is the end of, of the journey. I think this is just the beginning of the journey because now it's time for the eradication part of it where, you know, everyone who sees this, uh, it's a very difficult movie to watch, but I can assure you that none of you will go away from here without having been impacted in some way, and that's where the individual action comes into place. And if it wasn't for, uh, you know, a person like Paula who took that first step to speak about a taboo subject. And trust me, we had major pushback. So it hasn't been easy, but uh, you know, we've come a long way. We've come a, a long way from the time where you couldn't talk about these issues to now having public conversations. So 
I am more than honored to be part of this movement and will continue for the next generations to come. Um, please, please speak loud and clearly because we are live streaming this and um, the people on the, on the other side want to, want to hear it as well. Well, of course, it comes under the larger rubric of vi violence against women, and it comes under the even larger rubrics of human rights abuse, and that is true. The reason we want to specify honor-based violence is because honor-based violence is like pre premeditated murder. The honor killings that take place are very different from uh, domestic violence, for example. Not that we undermine any of that, but honor-based violence is based in a cultural customary practice. You know, it is something that has existed for thousands of years, and it is done in a way where families are involved, where it is premeditated, where it is planned, and, and the intention of the person who is taking the life of the other person is to preserve the honor of that, the family, the tribe, the culture. And so the work has to be done from within uh, cultures. The work has to be done to educate. Uh, it's not just that you, um, you know, take the perpetrator, uh, you know, you have a case in, in the court and then you put them in jail. This is a long-term education. And this is why we want honor-based violence to be a separate heading under the legal system. I was invited by the Swedish government and I was horrified to find that they have a very, very large number of honor killings taking place, but they were not addressing them head on because they were all jumbled up and, you know, okay, we, we, we have violence, we have uh, domestic violence. But the honor killing issue is very specific. So honor-based violence being a, a separate heading gives society an opportunity to educate themselves about what happens in the background, what happens within families. Uh, it is something that requires counseling. It's something that requires massive education of both men and women at a very, very young age. And we can only do that if we look upon this as a separate heading. I just want to come and I think that's a great question and, and one that I get a lot. So I think it's incredibly essential to distinguish between domestic violence and honor-based violence. And there's a couple of reasons why, as Raheel mentioned, but one of them is the victims and how we deal with the victims. So I can speak about the United States and uh, in a particular anecdote of a young woman who was 18 years old in Virginia. And she was experiencing honor-based violence and was also, um, there was the threat of a forced marriage looming over her. And her family was going to be taking her back to the Middle East and marrying her against her will. So this young woman was 18. Why is that important? Because she was no longer a child. So the Department of Health and Human Services and the Children Protection Services couldn't come to her aid because she was already um, an adult. Um, she couldn't go to a typical domestic violence shelter. Why? All of the women there were married, had been married, and, and of course were experiencing violence um, at the hands of their perpetrator, namely their intimate partner. Well, she was never married, and she thankfully at that point had not undergone any kind of abuse. <coughs> so to put her in a shelter with women who had undergone domestic violence would have been I mean, frankly, probably incredibly disturbing to her and also the women that are there. Um, then you have the question of, well, there is not just one perpetrator, as Raheel mentioned. There's the parents, but there's also the family around her, the community, and the family back home in the Middle East. So she, this, this young woman, was able to go to an organization in Virginia and, and plead her case. and. Frankly, the organization didn't know what to do because there were no laws on the books to prevent what was 
going to happen to her inevitably. Um, it actually ended up that one of the board members of this organization took her in um, and and you know gave her a safe haven for a few weeks, and then eventually. Um, they, they sat down with the family and they tried to come up with a resolution and so on and so forth. But I want to compare the American case to the British case and Jasvinder Sanghera, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, but as you saw in the film, she created this amazing organization, Karma Nirvana. Well, she also campaigned for 20 years and finally forced marriage is a criminal offense in the United Kingdom. And what that does is it creates a, a, a set of... Um, a set of rules and norms that can protect victims and that can create actual mechanisms to prevent their forced marriage. So for example, when a forced marriage uh, is, is feared, right away the passport is removed from the family and so on and so forth. And we'll learn about that more this afternoon. But again, forgive uh, the long explanation, but what I'm trying to underscore is that <laughs> we have to treat these cases differently <laughs> because the victims are different and the perpetrators are different and we really owe them um, as much protection as possible. Um, I was wondering, it seems like that film was made with an for UN audience in mind, um, but yeah, with the rise of Christian right-wing groups in the US and the, the Christians, Catholics, Mormons, there is, a lot of what I've experienced as well with seeing my family and stuff, like things like forced marriages, underage marriages, family violence that has to do with religion and honor. If there's, you know, and all these statements by Trump supporters that America is a male white country and trying to reinforce all these patriarchal norms, has there any, been any sort of tying in to the U.S. or sort of these laws being taken to apply to Christian, Mormon, Catholic groups that couldn't experience some of the similar things? Okay, well, uh, you know, the most important thing to remember with the film Honor Diaries, and, and, and that I try to remind people, is that totally beyond faith, culture, nationality, creed, color of our skins, ethnicity, this is human rights abuse. And we deal with it from a human rights perspective. You know, this is abuse of human rights. So it, it definitely impacts everybody. When this was filmed on campuses, it was amazing how many young people who were not part of any one particular culture or an Eastern culture stood up and said, you know, I've faced this in my family. I know what you're talking about. It just gave them the impetus to be able to stand up and speak out. So yes, it impacts people at many different levels and it impacts people beyond, or, you know, beyond faith and culture uh, from the human rights perspective. And we promote it from a human rights perspective that it's humans, human rights abuse and we have to speak out. Any more questions? Um, on the uh, issue of the U.S., um, when it comes to the media, they don't like to use the R term. I mean, there's a great example of Jimmy Lang's Irish Lady, who was murdered. Um, I mean, one media killed the one, and then they took it back because they don't want to offend the Muslim community. So what do you think we need to do to make sure that media does say the right word? Because if there's been things like that happen, then they usually don't want to honor why not they need to honor her. Yeah, I mean, well, first, thank you for the question. And I just want to mention Nina's incredible film, The Price of Honor, which deals with this topic head on um, and was included in the festival last year. So definitely check that out. I think um, it's essential to be using the correct words. I mean, Layla brought this up at the beginning of the day about labels and, and being unafraid to use the correct labels. Um, I think the media is. <laughs> is an except built. <laughs> well, I actually, you know, it's a good point. I mean, I think you see journalists such as Bjorn and Antia and, and the other um, activists in this room who are doing the very best they can to connect to the reality and to rewrite some of the norms and scripts that we're so used to reading. And I mean, you brought up before the idea of social media. So when, if you see an article that has misrepresented something specific, I mean, tweet and comment and share. I mean, so often people do read the comments on articles nowadays. Uh, I think that's essential. One of my favorite quotes is um, Louis Brandeis, the justice, a former Supreme Court justice of the United States, and he said that sunlight is the best disinfectant. 
and it really is about shining a light. So the more that we can get these stories out there, the more that we can change the uh, the narrative on on all abuse uh, in all of its forms. I, I will add to this. Thank you for mentioning this, Nina. It is very frustrating as a journalist, as a writer, and as an activist myself. I often come up against these blocks. Oh, we're, you know, we're going to discuss whether we should use the word honor or not. There was a horrific honor killing, probably the worst ever in Canada, where, and it's mentioned, the Shafia case in this film as well, where this man uh, killed three daughters and an ex-wife four women at in one go. And the discussion that was taking place was, should we use the word honor or not? That's so offensive to the lives of the, the, the women that have been taken. And it moves away. It moves the focus away from the real issue. And that's, I think, part of the ploy, is let's have a discussion on the semantics of the word. Let's not discuss what actually happened. Uh, it's happened many, many times. There's been a recent case of a woman being murdered uh, just I think three weeks ago in Canada because she asked for a divorce. Nowhere in any of the news media except troublemakers like me are saying, are we going to talk about honor here? Oh, no, 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 no. no. And her body was cut up and found uh, because they were having issues and she asked for a divorce. So the word honor, honor has not been mentioned. And this political correctness is causing more lives to be taken. Uh, you know, the training that we need for law enforcement to understand the semantics of what happens if a young girl calls and says, you know, I'm being forced, I suspect that there may be some sort of an honor issue here. They don't know what it is. So that education is also important in, the, in part of the work that we do. And Honor Diaries has been used as a film to educate law enforcement and the judicial system to understand what the, the semantics of uh, honor is. So we definitely want to hold on to, to that terminology. More remarks, questions, I think, there in the background. Well, first of all, let me share with you that the Arabic Facebook page for, uh, for Honor Diaries has had over a million half likes, a million. half a million likes. So definitely there's a conversation going on in the Arab Muslim world about it. It has been screened in Cairo. It's been screened in Pakistan. It's been screened in Algeria. So it has been screened in parts of the world where some of these practices do take place. Uh, there has been pushback. Uh, CARE, which is the Council of uh, American Islamic Relations, tried to shut down a screening in the United States uh, because, you know, they said that it was uh, Islamophobia. I'm a Muslim woman. I'm a pra practicing, observant Muslim woman. I speak out against this. I'm in the film, and I'm very proud to be related to this film because if these issues are happening in part of the world where I come from, and I'll give you an example, in Pakistan, where I come from, the United Nations said that in 2015 there were almost three honor killings a day three a day and these are just the reported ones so that's something that should have us all look upon as a red flag and also why it becomes important to have conversation around the film and that's something that paula has facilitated the people who made the film where there's 99% of the time, I think there has been someone there to have a conversation with, and that's when people are able to address if they have any hang-ups or issues. And those who want to look upon it negatively, of course, will always do that. But the fact that it has had such a fantastic response in the Muslim world and from Muslims goes to show that it has had a great impact. Um, I, I know we're going to have to wrap up this session, but I guess I just want to say um, it is 
I'm overjoyed to be here today with all of you um, celebrating the second Censor Women's Film Festival. I know some of you have come in just now and we're so grateful to have you here. Um, if I could ask you to please um, use the resources that you have at your disposal. Uh, tweet about this, post it on Facebook, tell your friends about it. There's a live stream happening right now. And also, Honor Diaries and the Censor Women's Film Festival is a nonprofit and we have been uh, you know, trying our hardest to raise funds to continue this effort beyond Berlin. Last year we held the film festival in Washington DC and we are hoping to do another festival in March um, in Brooklyn. But our dream is to do this in Africa, in Southeast Asia, um, in South America. I mean, it, it can't just be um, in Washington, in Berlin. We really need to keep this going. So um, we've got DVDs on sale, bags on sale, scarves. If you just want to make a donation, we would be grateful for that. And I think more than anything, we, we need you to be our advocates to go out beyond this room and to amplify all of our voices. And again, while I have the microphone, I just want to thank BUILD so much for their support, for their fearless support, for helping us amplify this in more ways than I can name. And um, we'll see you back here for another film starting momentarily. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very welcome. Um, I'm afraid we have to, um, to, to, um, to continue with the, with the schedule. So there's yeah. another break now, and then we'll continue with the next film. OK, great. So about five minutes, I think. Okay. OK, excellent. Thanks.
Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to briefly introduce uh, the short film that's going to screen right now, uh, His Cucumber. Uh, my name is Shireen Atif. I'm half Egyptian-American. I'm doing my master's at California Institute of the Arts now in film directing. Um, and this, this uh, short film is a part of a video series I started in 2014 called The Way Out. And you can find the Way Out video series page on Facebook. Um, and it's about um, six Egyptian women who stand up for what they want. And I go through 15 series of, uh, a, a, a series of 15 questions to each one. And, um, and they are very bold and aggressive. And it, it was all inspired by the revolution in Egypt. And, uh, and then I, I started experimenting and doing some um, representational dramas to the interviews. And this is a, one of them. So enjoy. الستات كلها اللي هي اكتر ناس بتتكسف لما بتقول كلام ابيح اكتر ناس بتسمع كلام ابيح برضو في الشارع يوم انا كنت ماشيه رايحه السوبر ماركت كان في شخص واقف قدام السوبر ماركت انا عايز انيك بذاتك بتمشى كده كان في الشارع نازل زحمه كده بتمشى والشخص ده جه قال لي انا عايز انيك بذاتك فانا كملت خطواتي وقمت راجعه بقى لورا تاني بعكس على طول اللي حصل تمام؟ كلمتكيش قال لي انا ما كلمتكيش قلت له لا كلمتني نهارك انت مش هيعدي النهارده عشان انت دلوقتي عرضت عليا عرض انت توقعت ان انا واحده فاهمه بتمشي في شارع انا شرموطه خلاص؟ بنتفق انت رايك ان انا شرموطه مش هتدخل في رايك انا هاخدك بقى على الكلام اللي انت قلته انت قلت لي دلوقتي انا عايزه نيك بزيزك تمام وريني بقى هتنيكهم بايه اقلع كده بنطلونك وريني عشان انا من حقي نقي من حقي كست وكشرموطه ان انا نقي اشوف بقى بتاعك ده لو عجبني تمام هسيبك تعمل كده فوريني ابتدى بقى يرجع لورا ويصفر ويحمر وكده قلت له لا ما انت كنت سابع رجاله في بعض من شويه وبتحكي لي عن احاسيسك فانا بدي لك الفرصه دي اهو ترى كسبت معانا تقدر النهارده تنيك بزازي بس وريني وريني عندك ايه تعمل بيه كده حصل الموقف ان انا بقول له على فكره انا مش هسيبك يعني انت دلوقتي انا مش هروحك لو البلد دي فيها قانون كان ممكن اخدك البوليس وبتاع ما اعرفش ايه ونخلص واعمل لك كيس وخلاص تمام بس البلد ما فيهاش قانون فانا هاخد حقي بدراعي انت دلوقتي جيت طلبت مني حاجه حظك الاسود ان انا وفات نهارك زي التين فده اللي المفروض يحصل من وجهه نظري مع ال ال الرجاله القله اللي, اللي في الشارع اللي بتقعد تتكلم مع اللي رايحه واللي جايه تقول لها كلام منيل من ده لازم حد انا مش مكسوفه منك انا مش عيله صغيره انا مش مش ما خفتش من الكلمه اللي انت بتقولها كلامك ما وستخنيش انا ما بقتش قذره لان انت قلت كلام قذر وانا لما هقول كلام قذر من بقي ده مش معناه ان انا بقيت قذره انا بعبر عن عن موقف وبرد عليك في اللي انت بتقوله اندم بقى لازم تعلموا يندموا لان معظمهم ما بيعرفش والا ما كانش يبقى فيه اعلانات في كل حته على دكتور ذكوره ما اعرفش ايه زي الكلاب كده بيخافوا وبيكشوا لما يبقى اجريسيف وترد عليهم فلازم ناخد موقف يا جماعه ما تقبلوش <تصفيق> 